hear this all right? Okay, well, yeah, we got, do you have signal up there? Check, one, two, sounds like it's coming up. You, you hear me okay back there? Great, okay, cool. Well, before we get started tonight, in uh, Nehemiah, you can go ahead and turn there. We're going to be in, uh, in chapter 5. We kind of ended in the middle of uh, chapter 5 last week, and so we'll pick up there. But uh, I talked a little bit about it this morning, not a lot, uh, but wanted to share a few things with you, just kind of some observation stuff. Uh, as I had mentioned a little bit, the world changed a lot over the last couple of days, and nothing that, that should have been seen as... Uh, uh, unexpected. Uh, to me, frankly, it was a matter of time. And uh, unfortunately, I don't think that there is, uh, there's nothing that would indicate that it was just a one-off kind of a thing. This seems to be a very long, uh, this is really kind of a, a battle for Western civilization, if you want to say it that way without making it sound too dramatic. But, you know, I was thinking about this, interestingly enough, because you hear the news, and let's face it, secular news will never be able to grasp the problem. They don't understand it. It's, a, it's spiritually understood, period. So the fact that, uh, the, that the mainstream press would kind of swing and miss, I guess that's just what we should expect, right? So um, when it comes to this kind of thing, when I hear them talk about moderates versus extremists, uh, there is an element of truth to that, but I think you've got to come to some kind of an understanding of how those, those terms come about. And uh, it means different things when it comes to Islam versus Christianity, and here's what I mean. There was a time when I probably would have looked at myself as being a, quote, moderate Christian. And uh, that would have meant that I'm not, like, you know, crazy about what I believe, and this was before I was saved. Because I identified with something, in this case Christianity, but had no clue what it meant. So I was moderate in the way that I governed myself, thinking that what I was doing was Christian, but it wasn't until I started to understand the scriptures and apply them that I became fundamentalist. Now, that doesn't mean that you're, you become crazy and weird and everything else, because the Bible wouldn't expect that of you. If you say in my fundamentalism, therefore, God told me to go out and kill a bunch of people, I would look at you and say, you're out of your mind, because the, the Bible does not give you the option to do such a thing. So... When a person goes from being a moderate to a fundamentalist is when they believe to, to practice fundamentally the teachings of their text. So when we get to the moderate versus the extremist labels that they hang on Islam, I would say very much like where I am, it, it, it becomes a place when you start to believe in the fundamentals or the tenets of your faith. So... We need to uh, be able to answer and counter that foolishness that we keep hearing talked about by people who don't know any better. And it also helps to act as kind of a, of a filter when you're watching the, the news and all the rest of it because it's all misinformation. Some of it deliberate, some of it not. But I think most of us will probably, it, it isn't because of where it took place, it's not quite to the level of 9-11 like it was to us, because really there isn't a precedent for that. This, this is France's view, or France's version of kind of 9-11 on a smaller scale as far as death is concerned, but boy, it begins to kill a nation when things like this begins to happen. Now, the, the thing is that we can always understand bad guys are patient, right? They're patient. One thing they have is a lot of time. They basically said, we were here before, we'll be here after. One of the things I found interesting, back in September, if you're the type who read news, did any of you back in September, there were a few sources that were carrying it, and there were interviews that had allegedly taken place with people that were involved in ISIS and said that whole refugee thing, we're starting to embed our people in that sea of humanity heading off to the Western countries, Western, you know, westernized Europe, and we're going to be putting together sleeper cells that are there just for such a time. Did any of you read those articles? I, I grabbed one, and I, I wanted to bring it to you tonight and read a little bit about it, tell you about a couple of things that have happened here and, and things that are going on in this country that make you just shake your head. And what our government is doing, I don't fully understand. I, I know that there are only one or two options. The first option is that they are just naive in ways that boggles the imagination, or what they're doing is deliberate, 
and neither one of the, those options makes me very comfortable. Now, if it wasn't for the fact that I knew that God's on the throne and none of this goes by without his notice, I'd probably freak out a little bit because my wife works in downtown L.A. And we live in, you know, we live in a greater metropolitan area. Now, of course, these are still, Orange County still considered the burbs. But, man, if I was living out somewhere in L.A., going out often and all that stuff, you'd always be thinking in the back of your mind, I wonder what. So, interesting times in which we live. I want to read a few little bits and pieces of articles before we get to Nehemiah, just to put some things, I think, in kind of more of a proper context. I think we need to be aware. We need to be paying attention because the world's doing the things that it's doing, and like most everything happening around, if you don't look at it through a biblical prism, you don't understand how to put it all in context, because let's face it, the encroachment of Islam is, nation, or is worldwide. Their stated goals, the fundamentalists, is what they call a caliphate. And if you're not familiar with what a caliphate is, there is a caliph. He's the leader of the branch of Islam, of whoever's wanting to put him out. And the Shiites and the Sunnis are killing each other, trying to take that dominance. What you may not have noticed, did you guys see that there was a bombing in Beirut the day before France? And about 50 people died that day in Lebanon. We don't hear a lot about it because it's not Paris. But that was happening the day before in Lebanon. So people are, are dying because of the fundamentalist or radicalized Islam. But they believe that it is God who is giving them the, the, uh, uh, the backing of their ideology. I mentioned that this morning. It is an ideological thing, domination. Mankind's basic nature is to dominate someone else, to be, if you will, in charge. Interestingly, when it comes to Islam, it is an ideology wrapped in a religion. And so they feel that it is their God-given right to subdue the earth for Allah and set up a caliphate. So that is the, that's the goal, and you're not going to talk them out of it. Now, just the question becomes, when do they have the numbers where they can make that happen? And when the West continues to open the doors to them and make excuses, it's going to have a detrimental effect on the day-to-day the -day lives of the people who live there. Interestingly enough, this you know, begins to start to shoot holes, probably a bad word for it, a uh, bad way of putting it. It begins to um, really kind of blow holes into the idea of gun-free and you know, France is a gun-free zone and everything else, but it didn't keep the bad guys from getting the stuff in there. If you have the desire to do it, you'll, you'll see what this guy said from an article back in September. So let's have a word of prayer. We'll look at these, make some comments, then we'll get into Nehemiah. So Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you that you have opened our eyes to truth. We see the world around us, and we recognize that given enough time, man would consume himself, and that you intervene in that whole process. But we know that things are really moving to a place when... You will save us from ourselves. We pray, Father, that we, the faithful that look to your word for an understanding, would not only find that understanding, but live it. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to be mindful of the world around us, not just filled with knowledge, but that that knowledge that you give us can be used in a way to reach out to a world that is really just reeling and not understanding things. We ask, Lord, that you would create those opportunities, but help us to have our own understanding straight that we may know how to proceed. So we give you thanks for this evening. We thank you for your word that puts all these things into an understandable context for our hearts and minds. God comfort, we pray this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. In a September article, just one of many, this was a guy that during all of the refugee stuff, they just noticed that there was just people coming in by the hundreds of thousands. And so they started to ask questions and they found a guy who was very candid considered himself to be kind of one of the smugglers, and, uh, and he was speaking on behalf of some of the things that he could say for ISIS. And I'm just going to excerpt a little bit of it. He said, the Syrian operative claimed more than 4,000 covert ISIS gunmen had been smuggled into Western nations hidden amongst the innocent refugees. Now, innocent refugees, that is the, the overwhelming number of the people who were there are innocent refugees. They're just trying to get away from the disaster that's happening in their home countries. Anywhere, isn't it interesting that anywhere where Islam has the ability to just run roughshod over people, most normal people are going to want to get out. 
Some of the most appalled people on the planet are Muslims, more in the moderate camp, that just say that's not a representation of us. You want to basically say, read your history. That's how Muhammad used to roll. So, it says, the ISIS uh, smuggler who is in his 30s is described uh, as, was described as having a trimmed jet black beard, as though that matters, uh, revealed his ongoing clandestine operation and that it has now become a complete success. He says, just wait, quote unquote, as he smiled. The Islamic State operative exclusively, uh, s spoke exclusively on the condition of anonymity and is believed to be the first to confirm plans to infiltrate Western countries. Now, when this was first published back in September, people would have looked at that and said, come on, you're just trying to make the poor people escaping into something that they're not. You're making them into monsters. So in September, people could have said any way that they wanted to dismiss this whole article. Now the events as of the end of last week have made it inescapable. So it's, it goes on to say they are following the well-trodden route taken by refugees and migrants that are fleeing, traveling across the border of Turkey, then on boats across Greece and throughout Europe. There are more than 4,000 covert gunmen, quote, ready across the European Union, he claimed. The operative said the undercover infiltration was the beginning of a larger plot to carry out revenge attacks on the West in retaliation for the U.S.-led coalition airstrikes. If you remember in the early days of that, who, was the first people, who were the first people that joined us in those first raids and the first bombings of ISIS? France. Now, it goes on. He said, if someone attacks me, for sure I will attack them back. It's our dream that there should be a caliphate not only in Syria but in all the world and we will have it soon, God willing. This was said in September. Again, people could have wrote him off as crazy. It'll never happen, yada, yada, yada. If you have gone to, and you will never see it in our press, you go to the people that have done documentary work in Europe and see what's happened since this migration began. This migration didn't just begin in the last few months. It is more than a decade long. There are entire areas of, of Europe where police won't even go. This is the problem when you have immigration and refugees without assimilation. This is what happens, and it's happening here as well. So I come from a family of two immigrant families. Both my mother and my father, their parents immigrated here from other countries. But our families assimilated. I mean, they, they, this was part of, they had gone to this country, they had come to this country to be a part of what it was. Now, of course, they carried bits and pieces of their culture, but they very much believed in what this place represented, and so the family integrated. That's not what's taking place here. Now, he goes on to say this, Islamic State extremists are taking advantage of developed nations' generosity towards refugees to infiltrate Europe. Again, this was said in September, all right? The lethal ISIS gunmen use local smugglers to blend in and travel amongst the huge tide of illegal mi uh, migrants that are flooding into Europe. More than 1.5 million refugees have fled into Turkey alone, dis uh, desperate to escape the bloodshed in Syria. There is no way to minimize the stuff that's taking place in that part of the world. No one disputes it. It is horrid. The, the conditions and all the rest of it. The question is, what happens when they leave? And you just ask yourself, it's a common sense thing. If you're the bad guys and you see a whole bunch of people fleeing and you see to where they're going and people accepting them wide open arms, exploit that. I would, if I was the bad guy, hey, everybody's opening their arms to them, put some of our guys in. It's that whole sleeper cell mentality. It's a new world. It just is. And if anybody would have read this and said, that's just nonsense, they're making stuff up, it's done because they're wanting to make news and they're being, you know, provocative and all the rest of it, folks, it just happened. If we don't think this is going to happen again, we are kidding ourselves. It just depends on where and when. So Britain's a big target. Of course, the things that are happening without it being against the governments, look at the things that are happening in Sweden. Look at the things happening in Germany. Do your research and see because we're starting to, to move it this way. He said, two Turkish refugee smugglers, they backed up the claims made by the Syrian operative. One admitted to helping more than 10 trained ISIS rebels infiltrate Europe under the guise of asylum seekers. He said, I'm sending some fighters who want to go and visit their families. Others just want to go to Europe to, quote, be ready. 
Now, one thing that we know, at least one of the people that they have found had a Syrian passport. He was one of the recent refugees. If they are able to find everybody who had anything to do with this, I think that they will find that that's exactly where it came from. It was a mixture of people that had been infiltrated in, mixing in with those who had become radicalized from within. Again, same things happening in this country if you're willing to go ahead and read the sources on it that, that are willing to talk about it. Well, he said, the Syrian operative, a former member of the nation's security forces, said ISIS had ambitious plans ahead. Boy, isn't that enough to give you a uh, pause. He said, there are some things I'm allowed to tell you and sing, some things that I am not. He said, we repeat the call to Muslims in Europe and uh, the infidel West and everywhere to target the crusaders in their home countries and wherever we find them. We will, be, uh, we will be enemies in front of God to any Muslim who can shed a drop of blood of a crusader but abstains from doing that with a bomb, a bullet, a knife, a car, a rock, or even kick or a punch. So, that idea that murder is of the heart and not of what you have in your hand. We're seeing it take place all over the place. Let's just be honest about this. Paying attention to it. Meanwhile, the same kind of blindness, I guess you could say, that is happening to Europe is happening here as well. And the idea that we would want to embrace uh, people who are in desperate straits, there is no question about it. We should. I mean, you know, if we have the wherewithal to do it, you want to try to get people out of those horrid situations. The problem is, when people come, you have no clue where they're coming from. You don't know how genuine they are. You don't know their intentions. And there's no way to find that out because there's no record of things. So this one is taken from uh, uh, another um, article that is, uh, it basically this is the first opening line. The Obama administration is moving to increase and accelerate the number of Syrian refugees who might be admitted into the United States by opening new screening outposts in Iraq and Lebanon, administration officials told Reuters on Friday. So the same day that all this took place, earlier in the day he had had an, an, um, uh, an interview, President Obama, when he was talking about ISIS and said they're contained. Remember it was supposed to be destroy and dismantle at the beginning. Now they're contained and they're not moving, and then later on that day they pull off what they did in, in, in Paris. So, once again, underestimating your enemy. See, the thing was, in the last administration, everybody was talking about cowboy dis diplomacy and how we had become proactive. Now we've changed everything and we've become reactive. We aren't engaging, we're withdrawing. Well, that has, you know, both, both of those options uh, have their, their, you know, appeal to some people, but also they have their weaknesses. So, interestingly enough, we have seen what happens with disengagement. It doesn't do anything but embolden the enemy, and it makes it easier for them to get in. So they're doing this, and then we see, it says, we want to be in, play, in a place where we can push, push out really ambitious goals. Uh, this is because of the settlements that are, are beginning to happen in, uh, in New Orleans. They've got about 10,000 that have just been brought to New Orleans. And so one of the people that's doing community outreach says we want to be in a place where we can uh, push out really ambitious goals, said one of the officials who spoke to Reuters under anonymity. The State Department runs nine screening centers worldwide that serve as meeting points for the refugees, U.S. Homeland Security employees, uh, who have decided to, to uh, who is suitable for uh, resettlement in the United States. So it is the State Department that is doing the vetting of this and they're the ones who are placing these people. Now think about who have been the last two secretaries of state, Clinton and Kerry. And those State Department agencies, do you trust them to even buy ice cream? Well, it goes on and it says, most Syrians are now screened for potential U.S. resettlement at, um, at centers in Istanbul and Amman, Jordan. The new uh, centers are designed to, quote, increase the channels the United States has been reaching um, for Syrian refugees, the official said. And so based, it, it's basically you're screening, but how do you know? Because again, there's not the same kind of records like they might have on us. They don't know what our associations are. There's no way to say, you know, take a look at their social security number, their house, their, you know, their internet usage, all that stuff. You have no way of knowing. That's the problem. A radicalized person doesn't just have, a, they're not wearing a hat or a t-shirt. They're going to blend right in. So, in another development, Ann Richards, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State, told C-SPAN 
on Friday that wealthy Gulf Arab states such as Saudi Arabia and Qatar as well as the so-called BRICS and the BRICS would be Brazil, Russia, India and China um, uh, of these emerging market nations should do more to help in this refugee crisis. I would like to see more aid come from the Gulf states in the Middle East and relatively wealthy uh, compared to that are well relatively um, wealthy compared to Jordan and Lebanon he said. So anyway they're starting to say well why aren't the rest of these countries doing anything about it? Well because they have enough common sense to know that that's probably a crazy idea right now given the influx of bad guys. The, the wave of this is so enormous that there's no way to be careful about who it is that comes and goes. Now we are in a really interesting place as a dilemma as a church because we want to evangelize as we can. We want to show compassion. We want to see the doors open for ministry to these people. There's no question. I was talking with one of the guys that goes to church here and there, there's great stuff happening in that part of the world. But the interesting thing about it that the, the, um, the reality to it is that the bad guys are going to hide in the, in the plain sight of everyone else until such time as they are mobilized to do the things that they did. Again, people, did you notice when you're reading the, or watching the news, people are surprised that they were able to get Kalashnikovs into the, into the, the country, AK-47s. You mean they got guns into France? Yeah, they really did. Aren't you shocked? So does that mean that only bad guys are able to get them there? Yeah, that's pretty much it. You don't go to the gun store and you don't, you know, defend yourself. It's been stripped. Makes it easy pickings. Well, anyhow, this, uh, this article goes on. Uh, this, uh, yeah, I don't want to take a whole lot more time on this. Um, let's do the last thing on this. Basically, it's that the flood of refugees that are there, there's no way really to vet them. This one I think you'll find interesting because this is just today. Just today. Um, a Pentagon, the Pentagon transferred five Yemeni de detainees who had been held for more than a decade at the prison in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, to the United Arab Emirates, United, uh, the U.S. officials announced on Sunday. So again, we're, we're doing more of emptying out Guantanamo. If ever there was a time when it's probably not a smart thing to do, now is that time. Because the people who are stuck at Guantanamo are the ones that are saying, great, if there's gunfire, and they are fighting the infidels, I can't wait to be out of here. The idea that we're releasing them to places, um, does anybody even know what happened to those five guys that we gave away to get Bergdahl? They keep telling us they know where they are, but do they really? We don't know. Yemenis, Yemen, that tiny little place. What do we know about Yemen? Not a whole lot, right? It is one of the few countries where Iran has an enormous amount of, uh, of infiltration and they're the ones that are making war against Saudi Arabia on their southern border. Yemen, Yemen, that tiny little place. Wait till you find out about how many Yemenis are at Guantanamo still. And we just sent five of them back into their own neighborhood. Now Iran is the biggest, the biggest pot stirrer in the world when it comes to this stuff. But really they only account for about 15% the, the Shiite Islam, Shia Islam of, of uh, all Muslims. It's about 85 to 15. So such a small number compared to the total, but Yemen is a hotbed of it and they are supported by, by Iran. Well, um, Adil, Saeed, al the whatever, um, these guys, five of them, were given back because of the conflict in Yemen and congressional prohibitions on sending, sending Yemenis back to their own native country. The Obama administration has uh, cemented agreements with other governments to accept the detainees. Now, you would figure they would only send them back to high-profile places, right? The UAE? Listen to this. Earlier this year, the United States transferred four Yemeni detainees at Guantanamo Bay to Oman, a fifth to Estonia. Last year, the administration moved three Yemeni prisoners to Kazakhstan. This is a good idea? What do we know about them? What kind of security is actually there? Interesting. The Yemenis make up the single largest national group at the military detention facility. 64 Yemenis remain in the prison with 39 of them approved for release. Yemen is a tiny little place. And yet Guantanamo is way over the top, disproportionately, in the number of people that are there from Yemen. And these are the guys that we're sending back into their own neighborhoods. 
uh, just amazing. This is because the president said he was going to do this. He said he would do it in his first year. He just seems bent on making good on campaign promises. And of course, every one of his campaign promises have come true are the ones that we were hoping wouldn't. So the administration is showing that if it wants to close Guantanamo, it can. And it can do it the right way by releasing people and stop holding them without charge, said uh, this Andrea Prasso, who uh, follows detainee issues for Human Rights Watch. Well, if ever Human Rights Watch is saying something good about your administration, you should change policy. She doesn't understand. Interestingly enough, send this woman right there to where the ISIS people are, she'd be raped and beheaded. Well, I assume the message came down pretty clearly from the President to the Secretary of De uh, Defense, and the time is now. This is actually the worst time for this to be taking place, but of course it is. The administration hopes to reduce the Guantanamo inmate population to below 100 by the end of the year as it races to complete the plan to close the prison and win back, uh, and then to win the backing of Congress. So anyway, just a few little samplings of some of the stuff that's been going on over the last couple of days. Folks, be aware of this kind of stuff and just be familiar with it. We are living in a very, very interesting world. And so here's what I can tell you. Interestingly enough, when I think, when I listen to some of the stuff that's being taught in churches, depending on what school of thought and what theological view it is, there is this, there are a few different schools of theology, but they have this in common. Somehow the church by its actions will hasten the coming of the Lord. They believe that they are preparing the world and, and the kingdom and they're going to help to usher the whole thing in. And it's an interesting thing that no matter where you look, biblical Christianity is on the decline. A lot of people call themselves Christians, but most of them couldn't even identify what a Christian is, biblically speaking. So it's an identification of branding rather than of knowledge and understanding. How do I know that? I used to be among them. From the earliest of my days, I would have called myself a Christian, but if you would have asked me what it means to be saved, I wouldn't have even understood the terminology. What do you mean saved? If you started to ask me what is it that gets you to heaven, I wouldn't have had a clue how to answer that question. So the idea that we are in an interesting time, we're seeing that the enemies of what it is that we believe are right at the doors and inside the church for that matter. However, what we're seeing is a radicalization of other world religions and in particular Islam. And it's on the march. Do I get freaked out about that? Not really. Is there anything that we can do about it? Not a thing. This is what I would expect to see before the Lord returns. So I'm not bothered by this. I don't like it, but it's exactly what I see and I think that we're on the cusp of the Lord's return. Now when that is, no clue. In the meantime, what am I supposed to do? Be busy about it, uh, being involved in the people that, uh, that God brings into my life, being faithful to the Word of God, and doing what He's asked me to do in the time that I have, bringing us to Nehemiah. Precisely his story is exactly what I had just said. So Nehemiah chapter 5. Let's turn there. If you remember last week, what we had looked at was... The, the work that Nehemiah was doing, it was beginning to uh, near a completion. As we've seen over and over and over again, as soon as God begins to do a great work, opposition comes along. It just kind of goes with the territory, right? Well, at every attempt, the bad guys have not been able to get Nehemiah to do the wrong thing. Keep, he keeps doing the right thing because he's not being persuaded one way or the other. So he continues along. What happens, but people from within start to subvert the work and they start to extort one another. The powerful exert their power over the weak and it's destroying them from within. So Nehemiah calls them out. Said, you guys, are, this is usury. You're putting people into slavery and you're making the, the loans that they're taking impossible to pay back. So he calls them out. And they have to restore everything that they've stolen with interest. I love it. Now, it would be one thing for Nehemiah to be able to say to them, what you're doing is wrong. It's in the first 13 verses of chapter 5. It would be one thing for him to say that, but then not live it himself. We call that hypocrisy. It's one thing for, and I think of it, if I'm going to put it in a modern context, it's one thing for a, a pastor, quote unquote, to go ahead and preach all kinds of stuff over the pulpit, but not live it himself. There's nothing worse than a hypocrite. And so Nehemiah 
had the opportunity to play the hypocrite by saying what you guys are doing wrong, but did he live it himself? Now, of course, what we're reading tonight, remember, it's written kind of retrospectively. He's looking back on the events. You'll notice it by the way that he says the things that he says. So he's just called out all the guys, the, the, you know, the big money guys, about their extortion. And so, at verse 14, he says, Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor, the appointment came through the Persian kings. This was the place that he had been sent. So he had, Nehemiah wasn't just some dude building a wall. This was a guy who had the backing of the government that, that oversaw things there. The Persian Empire oversaw that part of the world, though it's detached. And Nehemiah, at this point, because of his position, could have been just like the guys that he had openly rebuked and called to account and challenged. So this guy was the man there where, with that, in that place, and he had every ability to extort. He could have been just as bad as the other guys. Moreover, from that time I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah from the 20th year to the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes. Twelve years, neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provisions. Now, that doesn't mean that he had a governor. That means he was the governor, and part of that was that people would need to bring things to him. Food, drink, money, all the rest of it. It was part of his position. And he said, I did not take it. I was entitled to it, but I would never take it. And now why would that be? Because he couldn't stand the usury that was taking place by other people. So for 12 years, he was there to have himself supported voluntarily and not because of who he was. Now, that's very similar to Paul. Remember? Paul would say it over and over again. You can find it in his writings. This was a guy who would find a voc He had a vocation, tent maker. So he would earn things for himself. Now, sometimes people would go ahead and take care of him. They would give him lodging. They would do everything else. But he never came there and saying, not coming to your town unless you go ahead and pony up. Here's my list of requirements for me to come to your town, like a lot of the guys nowadays that are these you know, itinerant preachers. You want me to come to your town? Well, the tickets are going to cost this much. And, you know, yada, yada, yada. Well, Paul would say, I'm coming to town. I'll try to find some work there. People would always, you know, obviously look to, to bring him in and support him and all the rest of it. But he never made it a prerequisite. Very similar here. Nehemiah, same way. Verse 15. But the former governors who were before me, they laid burdens on the people. They took from them bread and wine, besides forty shekels of silver. Yes, even their servants bore rule over the people. But I did not do so. Why? Because of the fear of the Lord. I was entitled to this, but I knew that God wouldn't approve. Why? Because it was a man-made construct. It was the idea of privilege because of position. He realized that the position wasn't uh, one to exert the rule over the people and it wasn't given to him by people. He realized that it was God who raised him for this task and it was to God whom he would answer. So I'm not going to do what the earth tells me I can do. I'm not going to do what the world or the people before me did. I'm going to do what's right and honorable before God. So he had this fear. What a great thing that is. Fear of God. Boy, if there was more of it, the church would be in a much better position, wouldn't it? Sometimes you see things done in the name of God by pastors and leaders and all the rest of it, and you think, oh man, I will not want to be them as they stand before him someday and give account. Indeed, I also continued the work on the wall, and we did not buy any land. All my servants were gathered there for this work. Look, we didn't get back to our homeland and say, let's hunker down. Let's plan on being here for a while. We didn't buy land. We didn't do anything. The normal trappings of life were not the reason for us being there. Interesting. So verse 17, And at my table were 150 Jews and rulers besides those who came to us from the nations around. So these were the people doing the work. They were the ones that came with him. The work of the wall was being done and he had other people from the surrounding areas. Now what happened in this case, people began to provide for them because they were involved in the work. Look at verse 18. Now that which was prepared daily was one ox, six choice sheep, also fowl were prepared before me, and once every ten days an abundance of all kinds of wine. Now, as you look at that, you would figure that could be provision for maybe as much as five to six hundred people. 
Now, that doesn't surprise me because the scope of the work was enormous. And they did it in such quick, uh, quick manner, you can see that that is quite the crew, and it would take quite a bit to sustain them. So that's, that's quite a bit. Well, notice he says, um, all kinds of wine, yet in spite of this, I did not demand the governor's provisions. Why? Because the bondage was heavy on these people. They were having it taken from the normal course of things. I wasn't going to lay another burden on it. And God provided for all those who did the things. And it didn't cost the people who were there. Notice what he says at the end of this. Remember me, my God, for good according to all that I have done for this people. Now, at the time, the idea of reward... It was much more of a law kind of a thing. They did things in service to the Lord and they were expecting to make that known so that, and this is, this is not Nehemiah being, you know, pompous and pumping himself up or anything else. This is just kind of the merit, if you will, of the way that things were done under the old covenant. It was about do this and don't do that. It wasn't necessarily a grace thing like we look at it. Actually, for the Christian, the last thing that we want to do is say, God, reward me for what I've done. Because, <laughs> man, back then, different thing, because they didn't have Jesus to look at and say, reward me for what I've done. We look back at his work and say, God, thank you that I'm not rewarded for my labor. Now, may my labor in these days bring glory to you, but I thank you for what you've already done for me in Jesus. So if we were going to do an equivalent to this, there is nothing wrong with us being able to say, Lord, I hope that my life brings you glory. I hope that when you lay things out for me that I am obedient to the work that you've put before me. That my works may show, like, think of what Jesus said there at the Beatitudes, let your light so shine before men that what? They would see your works and do what? Glorify your Father in heaven. Cool. We should do those things. No question about it. Now, he's looking at this, God reward me based upon these things. Interesting. Just a different time. If Nehemiah were alive today, I bet you this guy would be dynamite. Boy, can you imagine a person who is so dedicated to the law, being able to see it through the eyes of grace? Think of Paul. Man, was that a changed person. Think of all the guys that were the believers around Jesus' time once they were born again, coming from what they did believe to a place of operating by grace. Wow. What a change, huh? Well, chapter 6, again, written in hindsight, retrospectively, looking back at how things were. Chapter 6 begins like this. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, though we at the time had not hung the doors and the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, come to us, meet to, to meet together in, uh, among the villages in the plains of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. Well, first of all, if anybody wanted to invite you to a place called Oh No, would you go? I know, it's just a real poor attempt at humor. Oh No wouldn't have meant the same thing to them, I'm sure. But, you know, come and meet us in the Valley of Ono. Seriously? Couldn't have picked a better place? Where is the Valley or the Plains of Ono? Well, think of Jerusalem and those areas. It's up in the mountains. If you are understanding a little bit of the, the geography of it, think if you were to snap a line, say, between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv or Joppa, that area along the Mediterranean. Once you come out of the hill country and you start to get into the flatlands heading towards the west and a little bit towards the east or towards the north, that's where you're going to look for the plains of Ono. It's out that way. So anyway, come on out to us. We want to talk about all this stuff. Well, so far, Sanballat and the rest of his bunch of cronies have been nothing but an irritant to Nehemiah. So why would anything here be different? Now that they're starting to be, you know, successful in the work, the idea that he would take time out to do this, it seems almost ridiculous. And that's exactly how he reasons this. So look at what he says. Now, they said, come to us, meet us in the, the plains of Ono, but they sought to do me harm. How does he know that? Well, he's writing about it retrospectively. So verse 3, so I sent messengers to him saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I, um, while I leave it and go down to you? Got my priorities. Why bother with you, bunch of chubs? You've been messing with us since day one. 
I don't care about who you people are and what you want to do. All of your motives have been wrong to this point. So it's his way of just saying, forget it. So they sent me this messenger four times, and I answered them in the same manner. Then Sanballat sent his servant to me as before the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. All right, so you're not going to do this? Well, we're going to lie about you. Here's what we're going to do. Now, here's the letter. Imagine this, Nehemiah, the guy comes back to him four times, the fifth time. If you're Nehemiah, you think, seriously? The first four times wasn't sufficient. You're coming back and asking me again. Oh, yeah, well, this time I got a letter in my hand. This is written by Sanballat. And this is what he's going to do. He's going to go ahead and tell the king back there in Persia. Now, there's speculation whether or not Nehemiah may have sent his own. Who knows? But here's what the letter had said. It is reported among the nations, and Geshem, that's the Arab guy, all right? And Geshem says that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall that you may be their king. Now, by this time, Artaxerxes is still the same guy. Twelve years have transpired with him as the governor, and nothing has been shown in any way that they are subversive towards the government of Persia or else that would have made it back to Artaxerxes by that time. So, of course, it's, it's a false accusation and all the rest of it, but this letter is going to be sent that that was the whole reason why Nehemiah and the rest of the people wanted to go back, build fortifications, and then they were going to rebel against the king. So the letter goes on in verse 7, And you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah. Well, there were no prophets that did that. False prophets, perhaps, because we notice he does mention some false prophets and then in a little bit later in the chapter. Well, they're saying in the letter, hey, there's prophets and they're prophesying that Nehemiah is not just the governor. He's the new king of this new established nation. And so this would, if you're the type that may be a little on the paranoid side there in Persia, the last thing that you want to hear about is an uprising and a bunch of subversives in some far-flung part of your territory. So they're, they're, they're ringing all the right notes here. If they're looking to find a way, since they couldn't stop the work, they couldn't kill Nehemiah, maybe they can get Persia upset and they'll come and do it for them. That's what's going on. Let's remember, if we could see this in a spiritual sense, it's the devil who's doing all of this. God's brought his people back into the land like he promised that he would do. Even the idea that a proclamation went forth. We knew for sure this. A proclamation was going to be made according to Daniel. And that proclamation came about by Artaxerxes. Go back and rebuild the walls. Now, of course, the speculation is when did that take place and is there a formula? This we do know. Book ending this. A proclamation was going to be made and on a particular day Jesus was going to come in at the triumphal entry. This we know. That's historical. Now, the people who do the arithmetic part of it, that's where it gets kind of interesting to try to figure out when those two events took place exactly on the day. But we knew that the proclamation would be made and that would start the process till Jesus came into Jerusalem. That we know. So here we are. This is God making good on his promise and now his people are there. So here we see these prophets and these people they are reported to have said there is a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king, meaning Artaxerxes. So come therefore and let us consult together. If you don't want us to send this letter off, come down to Ono. That is the threat. Well, verse 8, Then I sent to him saying, No, such things as you say are not that, that are being done, but you invent them in your own hearts. You're lying about this. Well, of course they are. For they were all trying to make us afraid, saying their hands will be weakened in the work and it will not be done. Now remember, this was the whole reason for them trying to discourage them from the beginning. Wanting to weaken them. Oh yeah, you guys are going to build the walls. Remember some of the things that were said? Ah, it's not going to happen. If a fox jumped up on top of the wall, the whole thing would fall over. They're a bunch of weak people. It was all done for this one very simple reason. Let's discourage the work. Sam Ballad, the rest of these guys, Tobiah, Geshem, all of them, they probably didn't even know why they were such idiots. They were just being stirred up by the devil because he didn't want to see God make good on a promise that he had made. Seriously, that's, you know, what other explanation do you have? Now, those guys may not have known, but Nehemiah knew exactly why God had tasked him to do this, and he was going to complete that work. 
there was no way it was going to be stood in front of because he knew that he knew the task and he was he was determined to make good on the task wasn't going to be diverted one way or the other and he was always 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 consistent so even when it comes to this fake letter go ahead and send your fake letter you're a bunch of liars now what he has by this point is a little bit of a track record everything that this group of guys had tried to do had fallen short and they had not been able to discourage the people in fact the people that kept being discouraged were Sanballat and that bunch which tells us a very important thing if God tasks you with something stay to the task let him worry about the distractions don't fall for the bait but easier said than done right well verse 9 they were all trying to make us afraid saying their hands will be weakened in the work and it will not be done now therefore O God strengthen my hands that would be the perfect response every time that you see opposition God I see opposition strengthen my hands very simple well verse 10 afterward I came to the house of Shemaiah the son of Delilah, Deliah, uh, the son of these guys the, you know the, all those people that, with the unpronounceable names um, and who was actually a secret informer and he said to me let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us close the doors of the temple for they are coming to kill you indeed at night they will come to you now what is not really obvious by this he's trying to get him to do something two ways not trust God for the preservation of his life but this is a guy who does not have access to that part of the temple he's not a servant that way so what he's trying to do is get him to go into a place inside the temple that is reserved for priests and people of that particular tribe not his which would mean that it would be a great way for him trying to preserve his own life he would act in a way of breaking or not being in accordance with the law well this is a new twist see the devil is never really fully satisfied if you shut one door he'll look for another way in wow so isn't this a lot like the whole thing with Balaam when Balak kept trying to get him to curse Israel and he said look every time I go to the Lord God says no you can't do it so there's got to be another way so what was Balaam's uh, uh, counsel to Balak get him to do something that'll make God angry at them get them to rebel against God and then God will turn on them well this is the, a new tact as far as Nehemiah is concerned we can't get him to come to us let's get him so afraid that he goes running into the temple well it would have been a twofold problem he would quit trusting God for the well-being of his life but then he would go into a place that he's forbidden from going into really making God angry boy the devil's really good at this stuff isn't he now it's a balance of two things either he's really good at it or we're just really easy to manipulate maybe it's both <laughs> kind of maybe a bit of both well here it says and so I said should such a man as I flee and who is there such as I who would go into the temple to save his own life I won't do it now think about how discouraging that would be to everyone else hey guys haven't taken your money we built the walls and all the rest of it but now the guys that hate us are really angry see you later hope everything works out okay for you I'm going to go ahead and hightail it to the temple what would that do to the people that had all along seen him as being a man of great integrity now you would finally probably discourage the people that had not been discouraged to this point because they had a leader that would lead wow what a cool thing huh you think I'm going to go do this and and really draw the ire of God I will not go in then I perceived that God had not sent him at all but that he pronounced this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him now here's an interesting question and you can't really necessarily prove it one way or the other God didn't really show this to him till after he had had said no did God wait and was this a test I don't know pretty interesting though that God didn't say oh by the way you just need to know that uh, that this uh, this Shemaiah guy is going to show up he's going to do another thing just reject him the whole thing plays out and then he perceives so perceived God hadn't sent him not at all but rather 
he pronounced this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. Now for this reason he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in a way and sin so that they might have cause for an evil report that they might reproach me. Oh yeah, that Nehemiah, that God's man, as soon as there was a threat against his life in particular, he went run into the temple. If nothing else, even if they couldn't kill him, they would at least be able to discredit him in the eyes of the people and undo all of this work. Well, again, what does it take for a person not to fall into this temptation and bait? You've got to be plugged into the Lord and know that what you're doing is right and you've got to be before him at all times. This stuff just doesn't happen on its own. Good lesson, right? Good lesson. May God remember Tobiah and Sanballat according to these works and the prophetess, Noadiah, and the rest of the prophets who would have made me afraid. So there were false prophets in the place. Now, that letter that was sent saying that there were prophets that were prophesying it, were these among those? Would they have been named as the people that said, oh yeah, I, I prophesied that because that's what we believe in all the rest of it. Who knows? But everywhere he turns, from within and from without, there are people who are trying to stop the work. Interesting. We should be able to look at this, but here, one thing I do want to point out before we finish out the chapter, and I think this is pretty interesting too, and I mention it every time that a passage like this comes up, and it's important for us to recognize, we are never supposed to pray God's wrath upon people. It's just not the way that we should do things. Well, because we have seen uh, what mercy and grace looks like extended to us. I don't want to see anybody. I don't care. Even the guys that did what they did in France. Here's what I know. They thought they were doing the work of God. And the moment that they breathed their last, they found out that there were not virgins waiting for them, but an eternity separated from the God who loves them. That's the reality of things. I don't want to see a single person ever go and, and have to endure that. They were created for far greater things. God created them that they could have fellowship with him. They rejected that. However God deals with what they knew and how they knew and all the rest of that, that is up to him, way above my pay grade. Here's what I do know. God loved those people even to their last breath. And they rejected him. And now they have an eternity set before him or before them, rather, they'll never experience what it is to have anything other than agony. That's the reality of things. So the idea that we would say, ah, they got what they deserved, perhaps, but I find no joy in that. I find no contentment. I find no peace in that. I find that to be a tragic reality. So I don't pray, oh, God, just smoke them all. There are, we, that's our sense of justice, and I've probably said things like that. Hey, look, if these are people that are wanting to do this, take them out. Let God deal with those people. If, uh, if for some reason they are destined to be saved, they'll survive a, a direct bombing. You know, that's just the way it is. If they're going to be saved, they're going to be saved. But if not, then having them taken out is not, you know, I, I find no comfort in what is their eternity, but considering that they would take out other people, it's just the way that it is. But I don't find myself just saying, oh, retribution, God, just kill them. Not like this. Remember these guys, God, or Nehemiah says. Boy, how different things look through grace. Verse 15. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul in, the 50, in, in 52 days. Wow. That is some real progress. And again, we've been able to see a portion of this wall when we were in Israel last. So if you're able to go with us, you'll be able to see part of this wall from a couple thousand years ago, 2,500 years back. Interesting. So there it was. They completed it. And it happened when all of our enemies heard of it and all the nations around us saw these things that they were very discouraged. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Everything that they did was trying to, all the people that wanted to undo the work that God was doing, were doing everything that they could to discourage the people doing the work. But now that the work's completed, who's the person discouraged now? All those people who tried to stand in opposition to the work of God. So it came back on them. It happened when all of our enemies heard of it. All the nations around us saw these things that they were very disheartened and discouraged in their own eyes. For they perceived that this work was done by our God. There's the reason for the discouragement. 
if ever we are able to endure all the stuff that people throw at us, hoping to discourage us and take us off of our game, if you will. It's always wonderful when God ends up getting the victory and those people would have to come to the realization, whether they like it or not, that this was actually a work of God. So nothing that they could possibly do would have ever been useful. Well, verse 17 says, Also in those days the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and letters of Tobiah came to them. These were people playing both sides. They were double agents. People that were close to Nehemiah, but they were giving intelligence to Tobiah. Tobiah was sending things back to them as directives. Verse 18, For many in Judah were pledged to him because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah. This is basically a lot of the big leadership people there. So he was tied in and married to the nobles of the place. Totally, you know, double agent kind of people. Well, look at verse 19. Also, they reported his good deeds before me. They were trying to sing his praises. Hey, don't be afraid of Tobiah. He's just trying to do this, that, and the other thing. Everywhere you look, Nehemiah wasn't taking the bait. It's a pretty interesting guy. So, they reported his good deeds before me and reported my words to him. Tobiah sent letters to frighten me. That's the bottom line to the whole thing. They were trying to make him out to be a good guy, reporting everything that I was saying to him, but he always meant to do me harm. Well, so did those people. Now it's all starting to come to light. So interesting. We'll pick up in chapter 7 next week. Uh, lots of interesting things taking place. I'll have a report for you. I'll be uh, traveling on Thursday. Uh, I'll be going up to Cambria, kind of in the middle of the state. I'll be coming back Saturday night. I'm going to be around a lot of uh, good friends um, and just talking about things that are happening in the world and around the church, I'll be seeing Ray Youngen, uh, Warren Smith, Carol Matriciana, Johanna Michelson, good friends of mine. There's just a, a group of people getting together to talk about the state of the church, small group of people. I can't wait to kind of report to you some things that will be happening up there and um, interesting days in which we live. You know, there, those people that I just mentioned, what they do is referred to as discernment ministry. And so they have their areas of expertise, things that they're really good speaking about topically. And God uses them all over the world. He puts me in this really interesting position of being known as one of them, but I'm also a pastor. I have this, I have the coolest job on the planet, if you want to call it a job. I get a chance to watch all the trends happening in the church, but my first and foremost reason for being in, in ministry of any kind is just simply teaching the Word of God. It is a joy to me, but God's opened this really cool opportunity to be around some amazing people who have seen some really crazy stuff. And so those are some of the people I'll be hanging out with. I'll share some of that with you on Sunday night, maybe some of it on Sunday morning. We'll just see what happens. And... Uh, Really, really cool stuff. We live in such fascinating, interesting days. We want to be praying that God uses us in these days. Let's be aware of the stuff that's happening around us. Knowing how to answer it, how to be able to discuss it, but how to always turn it back into an opportunity to preach the gospel and come to a, a, an understanding with the people that we're talking to of at least what the truth of the word has to say. Whether they agree with it or not, if you were here this morning, as we looked at Paul's address there at Athens, basically it was, here's how things are. God's looked past your ignorance to this point, but he's looking past it no longer. He's calling you to a place of repentance. But again, when those people came up in opposition, Paul was not saying, look, let's go ahead and debate this and let's see if we can have somebody win the argument. He basically said, this is the way that it is. Do with it what you will. You'll answer to God for it. Just be careful about what we say and how we say it. Make sure that it's accurate and then let God deal with, with the fallout from it. What happens from there on? That's God's problem, not ours. Right? Amen. Amen? Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for your word. We're grateful for the things that we can see as, we, as they take place around us. You give us context for all these things. We know why they happen and how they happen. You've also given us your word that we would know how we are to operate in the days in which we live. God, help us to be faithful to you in the way that we live and operate. We pray, God, that you would give us opportunity all the time that we could give away freely those things that you have given to us. 
that we would be able to share the gospel in truth. We give you thanks for your faithfulness to us, how you've given us all things, as your word says, that pertain to life and godliness. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to be ambassadors to this world, a world that doesn't understand what it is that we understand. But we, like they, once we're in a place of not knowing, but you've revealed yourself to us. Lord, use us that you would reveal yourself to others. We thank you. We give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen? Go out and enjoy the cool 